All right, <clears throat> so a little bit different presentation or a little bit different topic area. Um, <clears throat> I want to break it into really kind of two components. Um, what we as a business from a genetic improvement perspective are, are doing in, in this area and application today, and then a little bit around some of the new technologies that we have in the pipeline. So I'll kind of first start with, with that and then move into uh, some of the more interesting technology pieces here. I want to start with some work by uh, Justin Fix, and I was at, as mentioned, I was at Smithville for a few years, and this is uh, Justin's PhD work, and probably a lot of folks have seen this, and it's been replicated, but I thought it was a, a pretty nice, nice piece of work, and, and basically we measured a lot of individual commercial pigs at birth, tracked them all the way through the Smithville system, measured lots of things around defects and ultimately mortality, and, and then translated that to full value pigs, and what Justin showed in his work is that as you increase birth weight, at least up to some plateau level, that that really sets the stage for a lot of things that are economically important with respect to, to profitability or not of the pig. Um, low birth weights mean a lot of bad things. Obviously, lower viability of the piglets themselves, higher pre-weaning mortality, and ultimately lower weaning weights. And as you track that into downstream uh, pig performance in, in this study, that translated to a lot of bad things, lower average daily gain, poor feed conversion, etc. So birth weight, if it can be genetically controlled, is really something we would desire to try and do. Um, if you look back, and this is PIC's um, total born uh, genetic trend for the last number of years, um, no different than probably lots of other breeding objectives by other breeding stock companies, you see a very nice steady increase. And depending upon the amount of influence one wants to put on it, you know, it's a lowly to somewhat on the lower end of moderately heritable trait, you can make anywhere from a tenth to three tenths, thirty five hundredths of a pig uh, per year improvement. Again, depending upon the influence that you put on it and, and also the amount of um, really technology that's in the background powering it. And so PIC did this, this for, for a number of years. And one of the things that we know, if you go back to the previous slide, if you do this and you do this only, you get a lot of bad things that come along with it that are unintended consequences. And that means larger litters that on average have lower birth weights on average, more individual litter variability, and a higher percentage of pigs that can't hit that full value target. <clears throat> In... Um, 2013, we did a few things within the genetic improvement program that had, and I'll show you some, some numbers here in a moment, that had some really nice positive impacts on this particular area. One of those is we included into the genetic evaluation or the breeding objective for PIC maternal lines two traits that are very much correlated to each other, pre-weaning mortality and individual piglet birth weight. Um, Prior to 2013, for about three or four years, PIC within its nucleus farms had been weighing individual pigs at birth. Um, obviously an added labor sort of situation. It comes at a greater cost. Folks on the farm don't like to do it because it does take up a lot, lot more time in terms of processing pigs. But PIC was doing this on the farms, accumulating data and information to see if it could have a favorable genetic response. And so after, after uh, collecting several thousand records, uh, doing a genetic analysis upon that, what we found was yes, indeed, that we could. And you kind of think of it two ways. There's, there's two genetic influences here for both birth weight and pre-weaning mortality. There's a genetic influence that the piglet himself has, and that's really based on the nuclear genetic material that piglet possesses, his ability to grow and thrive, and be more viable. So, so that's what we call a direct genetic component. And that's not terribly heritable. Uh, depending upon the line and, and sampling error, that's 3 to 5% heritable. We still use that, but you're not going to make a lot of progress with that. There's a second genetic component, and that's really the one that the sow owns. And that's, I really kind of break that down into the uterine environment that she provides to the pig um, before, before that litter is born. And that is under a reasonable amount of genetic control. And we'll call that a maternal genetic environment that she, she provides. And it is more heritable, probably twice the magnitude of the direct effect. 
So as we went through and learned about this and modeled this, we combined them both together and selected for both of those. So we get the direct effect that isn't terribly great, but we're going to capitalize on that, and then we select on that maternal genetic component as well. And so these two things are very highly related. We weigh every individual piglet at birth now for our maternal lines within our genetic farms. And if there's an associated pre-weaning mortality event that comes along with that, we'll obviously collect that as well and denote the reason that that goes along. And so in 2013, we incorporated this into the genetic evaluation. We already had weaning weight as part of that, uh, but it goes along with all of these other traits. There was something else that we did in, in 2013, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a few minutes as well, that really gives us, a, kind of puts this analysis on steroids, if you will. We started using genotyping and genomics in, in a new way, and I'll show you some of that in, in just a moment. So all of these traits go into the breeding objective, depending upon what line it is, if it's terminal or if it's maternal. Uh, terminal lines don't get this, because remember I said that terminal effect was very small. and We really don't care about the maternal portion on a terminal line. We weight these things based upon the economics of commercialized pig production. We run them through a bioeconomic simulation. And then we will go back and we will weight every one of these traits by what we believe is very reflective of its economic contribution to profitability. And this pie chart, <coughs> excuse me, breaks those out for you. Um, every pig gets an index, every maternal line um, has, has an impact on birth weight and pre-weaning mortality. So to show you some of the results, so this is a combination of the first trend file that I showed you for total born. See that nice, very steady increase. And then in 2013, when we started utilizing pre-weaning mortality and birth weight, you see a nice big spike up in the response for that. But notice what was going on historically before we started selecting for that. That's that unintended consequence of uh, pre-weaning livability going in the wrong direction for us. So when we implemented this analysis, we've actually recovered more than what we've lost since going back to 2006. The other thing that I mentioned is we introduced at this time what we call relationship-based genomic selection, and that's added to the spike increase in, in pre-weaning livability. Same slide, just with birth weight, okay? Without emphasis on birth weight, over time as we were making litters larger and larger, we were also an unintended consequence of making those pigs on average smaller and smaller. And again, when we changed that, started utilizing the data, both the direct and maternal component, you can see we have more than recovered what we lost going back to 2006 as well. So I think that's a nice add. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly not as heritable as a trait like carcass merit, but there's enough there for one to work with. It does come at, with a lot of added extra work on the farm. Um, we certainly, uh, you know, are willing to invest that at least in our top tier genetic farms to be able to drive that improvement. Talk a little bit about some of the other technologies that are behind this. The relationship-based um, genetic selection. So we do invest quite a bit in genotyping. I'll describe that in some detail. Uh, in our genetic farms today, we'll genotype around 100,000 animals a year. We do this on a bead chip platform. Um, where we'll get about somewhere around 80,000 locations across the pig's genome that we characterize for each and every one of our lines. <laughs> we don't do this in every farm because obviously, you know, it's, it's a world with, with limited resources. Uh, but we certainly uh, are trying to continue to drive the cost down on genotyping. We certainly want to do more than we are today because we think it's had a very positive impact on our business and on our customers. We do guarantee, however, that every male that gets selected out of those farms has undergone this very deep genotyping in, in addition to all of the additional phenotypes that get measured, the typical pedigree tracing that goes into the genetic improvement program. Uh, but we, we do utilize this today. So how does it work and why is it important? So there's, there's a couple of cartoons on here that at least help me visualize uh, how, how, it's, how it's happening. If you look in population genetics theory, what we have assumed for years, and, and this works, okay, it works without genomics. Genomics just gives it a nice boost. 
What we assume is that every boar gives a random half of his genes to every pig that he produces. Every sow gives a random half of her genes to every pig she produces. Full sib litter of pigs, on average they share half of their genes in common. Uh, half sibs share a quarter of their genes in common. And we know this is true, but we've used this pre-genomics, that's the approach we used in computing indexes and EBVs and driving genetic improvement. Great systems work, worked across a lot of species. When we go and utilize those pedigrees without genomics, we build this thing us geneticists call a relationship matrix that if we've got a million animals, it's a million by million matrix that describes based on that theory what we expect the genes for them to have in common. So a full sib, half. Sire, son, half, etc. What we know that goes on though during the recombination events, during meiosis, is that if you think of this as a biallelic di diagram of a sire, that they give different portions of their DNA to their offspring. On average, it's a half. What we want to do with genotyping, and again, going to a, you know, arguably a fairly deep understanding of a pig's genome across those 80,000 locations today, is we want to trace those specific segments that they inherit from generation to generation. We want to associate those with either a good or a bad, depending upon the trait that we're talking about. And so what this diagram shows you is that a sire will donate any piece, random half of DNA, could be at different locations, and on average they're roughly a half. So if you go down here to this bell-shaped curve, this is a bell-shaped curve of a full half-sib family, it would say on average they share half their genes in common, but there are some full sibs that have less than that and more than that in common. And that's what we want to try and understand. And that's really the, the underlying platform that we utilize. So that when we now build this thing and we augment it with genomics, these expected relationships change. So we've actually gone into our data, and this is a cartoon just simulated for, for purposes of the presentation, but we've gone into our data and it actually shows exactly this. It really tells a very, very nice story. Why is this important? There's several things that drive genetic trend. One of those is accuracy of selection. So by doing this, when we select young boars or young females at off-test, powered by genomics and all the other things that we're measuring, we're going to make a more accurate selection decision at that point than we, would, than we would if we didn't have the information. And so that's really, in a nutshell, what the genomics does for us. So if you go back to these trends, you've got a couple of things going on. I mean, obviously, it's a new trait that has, that's in the breeding objective. But genomics, particularly on a trait like this that's not highly heritable, and depending upon how you're looking at it, you can define it as sex-limited, it really gives you a lot of, of, of energy behind the selection decision and makes it a lot more accurate. <coughs> this is a, this is a, a wrap-up trend for, weighted across all of our maternal and terminal lines. Kind of going back, it includes all of those traits that we had on that first few slide, the third or fourth slide the growth traits, the, all the maternal traits. What you see when we turn this on is we got a nice kickstart from genomics, and then now we're, we're at a new slope that's greater than our historical one. Um, I'm a believer in the program. We're going to continue to invest in it, try and grow that investment, genotype more and more animals over time. That is our current commercial platform, what I call our commercial genetic improvement platform today. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, well, one other thing here. I often get asked, does this translate to anything meaningful to our customers? And I just pick, picked one slide uh, to kind of illustrate that. Um, I, we've got several uh, that, that shows some nice improvement. This, uh, this is a commercial system. Some of you would have seen these data. And I've just got highlighted regions around uh, total born, pre-weaning mortality, and PSY. Um, I should show you, and I didn't include it in the slide deck, the multiplier up above these commercial farms and then the nucleus farm that feeds those has that same nice genetic trend and has a nice phenotypic trend for those traits that go over time. So I believe that for most of our customers this is translating to improved commercial performance, whether it be on the maternal side or on the growing pig, pig side. So ultimately that, that's all that's important. Talk about a couple of other areas that are kind of the what's next in, in this entire area. Um, the first of those is, um, is around DNA sequencing. There was a set of presentations earlier around next uh, generation sequencing um, this morning that, that I found interesting. 
I said that our genotyping platform describes 80,000 locations. They're really randomly scattered across a pig's genome. That's around 3 billion locations across the genome. Same size pretty much as what we each share. Um, sequencing really just gets us that next very, very deep layer of understanding all of the sequence across the genome. Um, it's been around for a while. Um, since 2000, uh, during the Human Genome Project, that's really what got things kicked off. No different than a lot of other things, you know, we feed off what gets done in human research, um, and this is one of the results of that. Today, we can, at a very high coverage, we can sequence the mammalian genome, depending upon where you get it done and how many you want to do, around 800 to 1,000 U.S. per genome. Um, that's not yet cheap enough to do for us or for a commercial genetic improvement platform, but it is getting in that cost structure that we can invest in the R&D, and that's, that's what we're doing. Um, this can have a nice impact for us because I showed that nice steepening of genetic trend. I think minimally it can do that for us, and, and I know that's how we're going to use it. Over the next two years, we started this project uh, in, in November and started it with a collaborator of ours, the Roslyn Institute over in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, we are, are in the middle of it now. We'll sequence, depending upon how well we manage our research budget, somewhere between 14,000 and 18,000 PIC pigs. Um, not to get off in the weeds or the details, but how we'll go about doing that, we'll do it at different coverages. So it gives you different degrees of accuracy on the sequence, but we've worked out a methodology that tells us these are the most important animals in your populations you need to deep sequence. So we'll ultimately use that in combination with all of our historical genotyping to impute what I call impute up to full sequence for, for, for all animals in our population. I do think it'll give us this. I don't know if it'll be another, we saw about a 35% improvement in accuracy and also genetic trend. But I do expect some increase when we implement this, at least within the next two years. One of the things that it will give us, and, and it's, we don't fully understand yet, but we're going to be spending a lot of time in trying to discover causal variants around those difficult to deal with traits like birth weight, pre-weaning livability, and everything else that's on the list that we can phenotype and, and capture. Then also trying to understanding um, um, mutations that come about and create new genetic variation with our population. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit here about gene editing in just a few minutes. So again, we're in the middle of this project now. Uh, we'll be done with at least this phase of it uh, November two years from now. So we'll be at some form of implementation over the next 24 months. Switch gears on kind of the final topic area. And this really gets away with what at least I think of as, as typical historical genetic selection approaches. Um, imagine a world without PERS if we wanted to improve pre-weaning livability. I'm certainly not the vet in the room, but I've been around long enough to know that that would obviously be a very positive thing. Um, all my friends in the animal health industry, there's not a completely great vaccine, so it's a, it's a target area for us. Um, based on my limited career experience, I've never come across a pig that was exposed to PERS that didn't get, get the disease, that didn't show viremia, that didn't have issues with it, and didn't truly was truly not resistant. <clears throat> so without that disease, that would be a nice kiss to improve pre-weaning livability and I think downstream, downstream pig production. We've chosen to take a, a different approach, at least as we move into this area, and it's around using gene editing. Uh, probably nothing new on this slide to those in the room. Um, I spend a lot of time ask, answering questions on this. What is gene editing? And I usually start by saying what it's not. It's not transgenics. It's not including foreign animal DNA or synthetic DNA into a pig's genome. It's actually creating a new mutation or a mutation that we don't find at a high frequency. <clears throat> From a very simplistic standpoint, I call it just giving Mother Nature a little bit of a nudge. Um, trying to create a mutation that you want to create new genetic variation in and that you simply don't find it very common in the population. <clears throat> There's several different approaches to doing this. 
Um, one in particular that if you keep up on the research in this area, is probably the most commonly used today is around what's called CRISPR-Cas9. And I'm not going to spend any time on going into the, into the details of that, but, but um, certainly from a research perspective, it's not terribly expensive to, to do these types of research using CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, on, on a research basis. It's not commercially available today. So in December, we would have announced, along with Randy Prather's lab at the University of Missouri, um, that that group created the first truly PERS-resistant pigs. And this would have been around focusing on CD163. There's a presentation at the start of the next session from Randy's lab. Kristen will go into some detail around this project. If you're interested in it, I, I encourage you to, to go and listen to what she has to say. But these pigs, here's, here's some snippets from, from the actual uh, publication itself. Uh, the pigs not only, it's not talking about tolerance, I'm talking about truly resistance. They're exposed to the virus, and if you take a look, Here's normal viremia. This dark line on the x-axis down at the baseline are the PERS-resistant pigs. Okay? And again, it's not tolerance. It's truly fundamentally resistance. So, <clears throat> and again, if you want to hear the details, I encourage you to go, go listen to it because it's, it's incredibly interesting. A couple of things from a business perspective um, that, that we've worked on in this area. We secured intellectual property around, around this discovery, and it is multi-strain, okay? And Kristen may go into some of that. That's one important thing that, that we've built into our pipeline. The second was, uh, I believe it was in May, we announced an agreement with Caribou Life Sciences around utilization of CRISPR-Cas9 in livestock populations for the next window of time. And the reason that's important is, is that you have to have that intellectual property license to be able to do it. So for the time being, we've secured at least this technology and the technology to bring it to commercialization. Um, our technology commercialization pipeline is over the next five years. Um, probably can't share much more detail than that. Um, it, we do believe it's going to be FDA regulated. Okay, uh, So it will have to go through that process. That's the belief as we sit, stand here today. I've created a uh, created a couple of slides that they're in the world of plants, but the acceptability of this technology is very positive. Um, it's, it's very positive uh, from, from the FDA, but as we move over, move over into the plant world, they're not regulated by FDA. Would either be USDA or, AP, or EPA, it's not going to be regulated. Uh, so you guys probably saw this in the news back in the spring. This is a Penn State release around anti-browning mushrooms. DuPont Pioneer, who also has uh, an exclusive with uh, Caribou Life Sciences, they're utilizing it in their breeding programs today and plan to utilize it in addition to their transgenic products uh, in the future. So from a regulatory perspective, there is a timeline associated with it. There's a timeline to get it commercialization. Um, one of the things about this technology is that in the commercial pig, you have to have both copies of the allele. So the one that you want has to come from the sow and has to come from the boar for it to have an impact in the commercial growing pig, okay, or in the parent female. So one won't be enough. It'll have to come from both sides. And when we start to deal with a lot of these traits like this, that appears to be a very familiar mechanism. Um, if we get one copy, we don't get any impact, okay? So... Last slide, summary slide, and I'd be happy to take any, any questions. Um, I saw Bradley Walters this morning on the um, walk-in, and he says, man, you know, you've got a fun job these days. And I said, absolutely. You know, the last half dozen years have been incredibly exciting to be in genetic improvement and be a geneticist. Honestly, it was kind of dull for a while before then, but the next window of time, there's a lot of neat things going on. We're a long way from having a perfect pig, as we say within Henderson, in the Hendersonville office, but we're getting a lot more tools that take us faster that way quicker. So with that, I'd stop, answer any questions, take any comments that the group might have.